Hello, I'm Neil Francis. When it comes to reforming the law to permit doctor-assisted dying in strictly limited circumstances, should legislators be diligent? Yes, of course, and safeguards should apply. The Ending Life with Dignity Bill 2013, currently before the South Australian Parliament, contains a strong suite of safeguards. The following provisions apply. The patient must be an adult. The patient must have a terminal condition and be suffering unbearably. Two independent doctors must provide formal opinions. The patient must be fully informed about their diagnosis and prognosis, about what palliative care can offer, and about the procedure itself. Both doctors must assess the patient for sound mind and for any undue influence in making the request. If there's any doubt, a psychiatric opinion must be sought. If required, an approved interpreter must be provided. Any request must be recorded in front of both doctors and two other adult witnesses, neither of whom can be beneficiaries of the patient's estate. The request must be lodged in an official state register. A third doctor must examine the patient and confirm terminal illness and sound mind. Then there is a cooling off period. The patient may revoke the request at any time. Assistance must be reported to the state coroner within 48 hours, and a special oversight board reviews the cases and reports to Parliament. Parliament is required to review the operation of the law. But will such provisions hold? In the USA state of Oregon, which is home to the world's longest running doctor assisted dying law, I spoke with Oregon Senator Ginny Burdick. You know, we, we really didn't know what to expect, which is why the law was controversial at first. Professor Nick Gideons at the Oregon Health and Science University Hospital said of their law, um, I, I was probably going to vote against the law originally. Um, with particularly this concern about slippery slope and vulnerable populations and would the safeguards hold. He now supports choice under the law after years of experience. And Dr Peter Reagan, who has assisted a handful of patients to a peaceful death in Oregon, reflects on the provisions of the law as well. There's an interesting thing um, that people who use this option, it's, it's, a, it's an achievement for them, you know, they have to go through a process to get um, to get the prescription. It's a long, somewhat arduous process and they will particularly, it's not surprising when they complain along the way of why this law makes it hard. And I'll say, well, I'm glad, you know, and it's, it's the, the purpose wasn't to make it easy, it was just to make it possible. Dutch Member of Parliament, Anuchka van Miltenberg, confirms of the Netherlands law. We have to make very, very complicated safeguards, which does in my opinion, does not make it easier to stop living. And I don't want it to be very easy. I also spoke with Dutch professor Omwitiaka Philipson, one of the world's most respected and neutral end-of-life researchers, with 20 years of impeccable research under her belt. We discussed the vulnerability or slippery slope hypothesis. The hypothesis is often a very theoretical one, that it is inevitable, that it's logical thinking that it's like that. But in practice it did not occur in the Netherlands. All the, the, the worries of, of some people uh, didn't come true. There is not an increase uh, in ending of life uh, without an explicit request. It didn't spread to vulnerable groups. It's not more in older people. In the Netherlands, more than a half of all formal requests for assisted dying are still refused or lapse due to patient death before the qualification process has been completed. In Oregon, a third of those who pass the qualification process never take their drug, dying of their underlying illness. It's really no surprise that the safeguards hold. A simple comparison explains why. Across Australia, patients have a right to refuse life-saving medical treatment, but greedy relatives could pressure refusal of treatment just as they could hypothetically pressure for a request for assisted dying. So what statutory safeguards are in place to protect these supposedly vulnerable treatment-refusing patients compared with the Ending Life with Dignity Bill? Well, it turns out, practically none of them. Yet if there were indeed such greedy relatives, we'd have had decades of police investigations, court cases and front-page news about the refusal of life-saving medical treatment. But we haven't. Oregon Senator Jenny Burdick confirms the safeguards and the value of their statute. 
Uh, this is just a very, very positive addition to your health care options for people at the end of life. It just, it, it's a compassionate, uh, it's a compassionate measure uh, that will help a lot of people, whether or not they actually use it, just will help them have peace of mind at the end of their lives that they have control and they have dignity and they have the respect of, of your state uh, to make their own decisions about their end of life. The Ending Life with Dignity Bill contains a sound portfolio of safeguards for peace of mind. It doesn't make access easy, it just makes it possible for those in dire need. I urge you to give the bill your support. Thanks for watching.